So thank you and good morning to everybody. And my special to Rajiv Gandhi National Institute of Youth Development and NIT Great for giving me the chance to deliver my lecture on this certificate course on cloud computing. So today I will then discuss about this cloud computing platform for cloud computing environment for running the traditional monolithic applications as well as how we can leverage with platforms for running the today's uh, modern microservices. The overall topic of discussion is uh, listed here. So today is day three. So I think already we have some fundamentals or concepts on cloud computing. So I will briefly discuss uh, some uh, fundamentals in cloud computing that are necessary to understand these uh, microservices and uh, run those microservices in the containers or in the kernels. Then I will discuss about uh, the difference between the traditional uh, cloud based uh, monolithic applications and today's microservices. Then we will discuss about the uh, sweetness of containers, especially the Docker containers. So how we can leverage those Docker containers uh, for running microservices. And then we will discuss about the mini kernels and uh, how mini kernels uh, outperforms uh, sometimes uh, the containers uh, for running those microservices. And if time permit, uh, we can also discuss about various virtual scheduling strategies for running uh, both the uh, microservices as well as the virtual resources in the cloud environment. So let me start with uh, briefly about some uh, fundamentals and discussions on cloud computing. And I hope all of you who right now know uh, what a cloud is. So this point is to discuss about the definition of the cloud. Simply we can say that in cloud environment, there are two parties involved. One is called the cloud service provider who has enormous amount of computational resources. So basically the blade servers kind of thing. What it does, the blade servers are arranged at racks and the racks are placed in some rows. If you look at that, so within that, uh, if you see this within this village, so each of the tower is a uh, rack kind of things, and the racks are arranged to form a particular row. And there are some multiple rows up there. So that creates a huge amount of tremendous amount of computational resources. Previously, they, they deploy this kind of resources in the form of data centers for running their scientific jobs that needs millions of codes for, uh, for doing that experiment before the development of the cloud itself. But nowadays, what it does is that they provide those resources on brain because most of the time, those resources are sitting idle when the experiment is not going on. So the people thought that, can we put those idle resources on brain to the others so that the layman will call them the cloud service users that they can very easily connect and run their jobs in that enormous amount of resources. So for the users, they don't have this kind of environment and for the provider, they have some idle resources. So cloud computing comes to, to meet that gap that the users can use those idle resources and just pay a little bit of money for using those things. So cloud service provider offer those as a services and the cloud service users use them and pay money for using those services. But this is simply a distributed kind of platform. So how the cloud is different from the traditional distributed computing platform. So the features that make it a uh, 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 efficient one than the traditional distributed are listed here. The first one is the on-demand self-service. That means that users do not need to have an agreed upon uh, meeting between the provider and the users. Whenever the user needs, they just connect, create an account, and run their job. It's on demand and self service. There should not be any third party who will make the environment ready for you. So, whoever the, the user itself can use the services themselves. So, so, that means there is a very minimal interaction uh, between the provider as well as the users. The second one is the broad network access. The users can access those platforms using laptop, mobile, smartphone, desktop, or even server. So for any device, if they have a network connectivity, they can access those resources. So we say that it can access from a broad categories of the network. And third important thing is that these are not dedicated for the user. The resources are shared. So the multiple tenants are using the same resources, but they thought that they are dedicatedly using the resources. So the cost of the resources reduced drastically due to that multi-financial features. And next thing for the activity is 
that the users can reduce increase their resources or deplete the resources. So the scalability is very high and very quick. So that's why rapid elasticity is also involved in cloud environment. And finally, we can have a major upgrade in measure how much resources we need for the service. So that we will save for only the amount of resources we need. Like any other technology, this features may enrich the cloud environment, but at the same time, it also poses some uh, issues of using those cloud resources. Some main issues are the inherent latency. Because here, we need to upload our job to a long distance and to get the results back. So here is some latency involved. So if the jobs are interactive, cloud may not be best fitted for them. But if the jobs are of bad job kind of things, so they can upload once, job will be executed data to the third party. So we have to rely on them that they will not breach our uh, data and the uh, uh, services as well. So security also you have to consider and make some uh, burden to our adoption of the cloud environment. And the last one is the vendor mapping. That means whenever you are running your jobs inside the cloud service provider, you are using a number of APIs. Now, whenever you want to switch to another service provider, the APIs will not be supported here. So that means you are locked by that provider. So due to that handle locking also, you, you may face some problems. But lots of research are going on uh, to get rid of all those issues. And uh, many of them are already handled by the research community. Anyway, with that, you have some basic idea of how the traditional distributed computing environment differs from a cloud, cloud computing environment. But uh, ultimately, internally, cloud computing is an emerging version of the traditional distributed computing platform. Now, now let me discuss about what is the technology behind providing this kind of cloud services. What we mean? Suppose you have this kind of data center, you, you are a rich person, you have this kind of data center and huge amount of resources available to you. So what do you need some extra things to provide those resources with the cloud to the user? So the main technology that you need is a virtual agent. So we need a virtual agent and software. So this is simply a small software called hypervisor or sometimes called virtual machine monitor. What this software does, this software is a create virtual machines. What is the virtual machine? Virtual machine basically create a virtualized version of the hardware. So this is a virtual CPU. Similarly, you can create a virtual lamper. Similarly, you can create a virtual RAM. So those virtual hardware can be assembled to form a virtual machine. And on top of the virtual machine, you can install any operating system. We call them a guest operating system, which may be different from the corresponding host operating system. And with the same machine, you can create any number of virtual machines. For example, here we create two virtual machines. Now, the advantage of the virtual machine is that they are running in isolation. That means the jobs running, the jobs running in one virtual machine cannot access the job or resources of other virtual machines. So that also provides some kind of security to you. And based on your requirement, you can decide your virtual resources. These are the major services you can implement. How much CPU you need, how much RAM you need, you can decide. But they will ultimately be mapped to the available physical resources of the Blade server. So those, those Blade servers are coming from uh, these RAMs they provide. So if you have any question, you can ask in between also as well. Or at the end, we can discuss the question. So now, there are two types of hypervisors available in the market. First one is called Antoine or bare metal, and the second one is type 2 or hosting. The difference is that in type 1, there is no host operating system. The hypervisor sticks directly on top of the bare metal or the hardware. So hypervisor itself acts as an operating system. That allows you to run the virtual machine. Compared to that, in type 2, which is from hosted, here the hypervisor is running like any other process on top of the web. And then creates the virtual machine. So, so based on your requirement, you can choose any of them. The examples I have already mentioned that things so these are the example of the time one, type one, and we have box stations of eight million. They deploy the type one and some others they use type two. Both have some pros and cons. In this kind of environment, there is a problem. Uh, First, uh, you need to understand how to 
since they are gift to us. Look at these virtual notebooks. Whenever the application gives a system called ways, the operating system, these are just a traditional operating system. This is not a special one. What the operating system does, they directly execute on the hardware. So whenever they execute the, on the hardware, ultimately that this, this, this fault goes to direct execution on the hardware. Because the base tools are running in the privilege mode. Similarly, whenever this application gives a system call to that guest ways, this guest ways also directly execute on the hardware. Now, Generally, the operating system solves the race condition among the multiple applications. But the same thing occurs here. Because there are multiple ways, they are accessing the non-shareable resource at the same time. So, who will resolve this risk among the guest ways? This is the main issue we need to solve to understand how virtualization works. So, let us see some probable solutions to this problem. The first simple solution is that to liberate the concept of the rings. The rings are the security of the privilege levels. So ring 0 has the highest privilege and the ring 2. And ring 3. And the ring 3 has the least privilege level. So generally uh, we told that the ring 0 is the OS running in ring 0 in the privilege mode and the ring 3, our things are running at the user mode. But apart from these two rings, there is also two other rings in the x86 architecture called ring 1 and ring 2. Now, what the solution provides? Solution says that whenever you install that hypervisor software, this is running under the ring 0, the highest privilege level. And whenever you install some guest ways on the virtual machine, so they are mapped to the, or they are running under ring 1. So, obviously, whenever the application gives a system call, the OS this will try to execute daily on the hardware. What the hardware does? At the hardware looks at the ring view instructions are coming from ring 1. So, lower level privilege. So, hardware will not execute it. Rather, they will keep a trap to ring 0. And in the ring 0, the hypervisor are listening for those traps. So, all the guest players, whenever they try to access the resource at the same time, they will be trapped by the hypervisor. Then the single hypervisor, so they will resolve that issue and execute safely one by one within the animated hardware. So this is a very simple solution to solve the race condition among the gateways provided by virtualization software. But this simple solution will not work for most of the processor because uh, in many processor like Intel x86 processor, it is Intel x86 microprocessor, there is instruction called pop it. And the pop it instruction is executed during the context switch between two processes. Now, what they does, the design of the x86 is such that whenever it looks at the pop this pop instruction belongs to ring 0. So, whenever hardware sees that the pop instruction is executed from some higher level rings, the hardware simply drops that instruction. It does not send any prep. So, if the instruction is not prep, the pop instruction is not executed. If the pop instruction is not executed, the base to waste cannot perform the context switch. So most of the x86 Intel processors, they cannot cut from the context to it within the case operating system. So this simple solution will not work for most of the Intel processors. For that reason, they provide two solutions. The first solution is called the full virtualization technology, and the second one is para virtualization technology. So let us see what are these two technologies. First, the first one, in case of full virtualization, you can see, what is that? The hypervisor monitors the execution of the instruction and search for those instructions when such an instruction is executed. Once the hypervisor observes this kind of non virtual level instruction executed, they, they dynamically perform the translation called binary translation. As it is spread, and the hypervisor do some jobs on behalf of that. So even though they are not trapped, the hypervisor uh, accept this, they will be a trap and be solved. Even though hardware dropped that instruction, hypervisor is equipped with safety. So this is called the binary translation. But due to this active scanning and this binary translation, the whole system is slow. So that's why many people are not using the full virtualization. Rather, for example, Amazon AWS, uh, they are deploying this uh, paravirtualization. Or, or especially in the Gen technology, they are using paravirtualization. What the paravirtualization does? In case of paravirtualization, in this parameterization, what it does, they modify the guest operating system. First thing, 
Second thing is that instead of putting the gauge operating system in the ring one, the gauge operating system is also mapped to the ring zero along with the hypervisor at the same privilege level. And once they modify the kernel of the gauge operating system, whenever, whenever there is a system called the gauge operating system, they change every system called by a corresponding hypercall. Hypercall means the call to the hypervisor. So previously it was system call, call to the operating system. Now the system call is followed by a hypercall, the call to the hypervisor. So ultimately, whether this is a trap or not, they will be ultimately go to the hypervisor. And this hypervisor also does not put so much overhead because they are running both in the same privilege level. So for this hypercall, we do not need any context switch. So since there is no context switch for the hypercall, so they do not put so much overhead. The same overhead because uh, previously it was trap, right now there is a hypercall. So even in wise, this is not much. Whether the hardware does not need to still charge for the trap and this for the trap. So hypervisor sometimes provides a better solution than the previous one and can execute them safely. So most of the solutions we are doing today are following that parameter solution. But the problem with the parameter is that you need to modify the kernel of the best operating system, which sometimes is not allowed for uh, computer requests like Windows. So that's why Microsoft comes uh, with a modified uh, Windows version itself for cloud environment and they provide different events image from the cloud and different image for the traditional user. So with that, I hope you have understand how in the uh, cloud environment uh, the various blocks are executed uh, within the shared environment and how the virtual secures work. In the same way, the virtual LAN card, virtual memory and all those things work. So I just covered how a virtual CPU works and uh, 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 since already we have some discussions on the cloud, I am not discussing about how the other resources can be virtual cloud. Rather, uh, let me discuss about uh, the various services provided in cloud environment. Now, as you are asked, you are just using those virtual resources. That means you request to the cloud service provider, they use the hypervisor to create a virtual machine for you. As you are they provide a set of virtual machine to you you are accessing these are the infrastructure as a service. Now, once you get to infrastructure, that is the virtual machine, you need to install the various uh, services, you need to install or configure various platforms and the middleware. Sometimes, the users do not need to take this relay for their software development. They want to take those things as a services. But along with the virtual machines, those platforms and middleware for the services are being installed and they will be provided as a services. Now, in that case, we call it's a platform as a service. And sometimes the users are not interested to develop their own applications. Along with that infrastructure and the platforms, they want the ready-made application to develop for them. The users will just configure the application and use it. In that case, we call it a software as a service. So, so within that great server, either you can provide the virtual machine in the form of infrastructure as a service, or you can have a pre-installed platforms and provide a platform as a service, or you can have a pre-developed applications and you can provide as a software as a service. So the users can access the services at either infrastructure level or platform level or services level. And whether this is a software platform or infrastructure, internally this is executed and like the one I discussed in the previous slide. Now, let me discuss about a concept called Virtual machine migration, which is an important concept that you need to implement if you want to implement your own data centers of the cloud environment. So let us look at this. Suppose in your data center you have two blade servers. In the first blade server, you have second blade server. And in both the blade server, one virtual machine is running that runs some jobs. One one virtual machine is running here. Now you can observe that this is an unbalanced deployment. Because if I can migrate this one of the virtual machines to the others, I can terminate the uh, other, uh, other uh, I, I can stop or suspend the second virtual machine to save some energy. Hello. Hello, is there any person? Sir, you can continue, sir. Stop. So, so we can perform this kind of migration system for uh, this kind of energy efficiency because I do not need to run the second blade server that consumes some uh, energy. And not only the energy, we, we need 
to migrate the virtual machine for balancing the loads. So there can be unbalanced distribution of the virtual machine to the available uh, physical server. So we can migrate some of the virtual machine so that the balance load will be balanced among the available physical servers. Sometimes we need to maintain for maintenance. So we can migrate all the virtual machine to another canvas for the maintenance purpose. And once it is uh, up, we can again migrate that. But sometimes there is a host failure and the host recover. After the recovery from the failure, we may need to migrate some of the virtual machines to the recover uh, host. So this migration is an important task we need to implement. Then we discuss that how the virtual machines can be migrated uh, in, in different scenarios. So let us uh, look at various uh, migration technologies. So ultimately there are three different types of migrations. The first one is called the cold migration, warm migration, and line migration. So in case of uh, cold migration, in case of cold migration, what we do, we just shut down the virtual machine in host one. Suppose you want to migrate from host one to host two. The technique is very simple. Shut down the VM on the host one and we start a new VM on host two. The problem of cold migration is that all the previous running jobs are gone. You have to start at first and again all the jobs have to be restarted. But this is a very simple thing given. In case of one migration, what it does, instead of shutting down, we sustain the VM on host one. And then we copy all the states of the VM1 to host 2 and we can resume on host 2. So this is, uh, this will continue the jobs we are suspended. So all the previous states are saved and we can continue. But the downtime is high due to the suspension for the long duration of the copy. So that is sometimes reduced by light migration. What does in the light migration? In the light migration, while we are copying, while we are copying the VM state to host 2, then the VM still continues to run. So the downtime reduces drastically. So the line migration has lots of interest among the researchers and the uh, community who are using uh, the cloud platform. Now I will discuss how we can implement these line migrations in cloud platform here. Let us look at how we can implement uh, the line migration part. So for this, let us take an example. Suppose there is a host one. We think that host one of one virtual machine is running and we want to migrate it to host two. The first thing we should know that the backend stable storage are not directly attached to the virtual machines in cloud environment. Rather, they have large shared storage like a storage area network. So these storage area network blocks are mapped to the corresponding view. So for migration, you do not need to you need you do not need to migrate uh, those blocks to that. We just need to change the mapping or, or the mount points to the two. But we need to copy the in memory because the RAM part or the page, memory page are in the host one. So those memory page has to be copied to host two. So what we done for that, first we need to create a virtual machine in host two, and then we have to copy the memory page one by one to the host two, all the memory page. As long as the uh, uh, remaining memory page goes to a certain value that go below the threshold. When the uh, remaining memory page is very low, we pause the virtual machine at host one, we pause it and move the storage connectivity. The storage connectivity has to be the storage connectivity has to be moved to the host two and we have to start the virtual machine and terminate on the host one so that the VM is migrated. So main issue is that how can we copy the memory page while the VM is running? This is the main challenge of uh, live VM migration. For that, there are two approaches. The first one is called a pre-copy approach, and the second one is called the post-copy approach. In case of pre-copy approach, what it happens? So once you decide to migrate, what we do? We mark all the memory page in the source and the data page, and we start transferring the data page. But while we are copying the data page, the execution is still continuous in host one. So if a data page is copied, it is marked as undated. And if the uh, execution again writes to the same page, it again becomes a data. So the same page can become a data and undated multiple times. But as time goes, as you are copying that, it becomes undated. And as it again rewriting, it becomes undated. So gradually, the number of data pages will be reduced. Once the number of data pages is good, below some safe threshold, we suspend here. So if we suspend, no new data pages will be created. 
Only we will copy those remaining data pages and we transfer the CPU states there and we can start executing on the uh, second uh, host. So since we are copying, before we start the execution at the destination, this is called pre-copy afterwards. Contrast to that, there is a post-copy. In the post-copy, what it does, immediately suspend the execution on the host one. It only copy the CPU state because the CPU state are small. Only the process control blocks are there, we need to copy. We don't need to copy the memory bits. And we can, after copying the CPU state, we can start executing on the destination. Now, why can we execute and we try to access the memory page so there will be page fault? But each time there is a page fault, it will pull the page, missing page from the host once on the back end. And gradually all the pages will be moved to the host two and it will continue. This thing is an approach we copy fast, or we, we copy after the execution starts on the destination, we call it a post copy approach. So by this two way, the only the downtime is very small. That to copy the simple text, not the full memory page, and one, uh, one uh, migration. So that's why most of the uh, companies are following uh, both the pre copy and post copy approach based on the uh, situation, whether the CPU state is larger or the data page is larger. With that, let me now discuss about uh, the second part. So, with that, I cover the basics of a cloud environment. How a cloud service provider can provide a virtual meetings and how the virtual meeting technically works inside the web servers. And I show you how the cloud service provider migrates, perform the line migration of the virtual meetings for their energy consumption, for reduce the total energy consumption, for their load balancing, for their maintenance, for their recovery from the period, for all those things. Now let me discuss about my second topic, uh, where I want to discuss about the difference between monolithic applications and microservices. In case of the monolithic application, as you see, it's a traditional three-card architecture that is used uh, uh, in the older case. For example, we can have a database tag, we can have a business logic tag, we can have a presentation tag, or we can have a vertical security layer. The security layer can be for both database uh, applications and the presentation part. So, with this kind of monolithic application development, we basically develop this as a as a module. So there can have some database modules, some business modules, some presentation modules, and those modules will interact with each other and they will interact with the security module as well. But the problem with this kind of monolithic application is that when the applications want to communicate with the other application, they create a very complex interaction among the multiple applications. One application can be a big database, similarly other applications can be something else. So whenever they want to interact with multiple applications, a complex cluster based environment, the overall interaction is very, very complex. And that takes a problem in agile development. So, what we do, we move to web services instead of, instead of this kind of modular development. So that every module can be developed as a web services. And they can have a well-defined web service interfaces. So, with the development of web services, with the development of these web services, the interaction reduced drastically from that complex application to application interaction to the uh, interaction among the multiple services. Actually, we start to develop our service-oriented architecture or SOA platforms. So in service-oriented architecture, so there is an enterprise service bus, so those services becomes much more reusable and much more uh, uh, known to the others. So that the redundant services are reduced drastically and they can communicate by a a very simplified enterprise service bus to get reduce of the complex interaction among the multiple services. So the services will deploy to the enterprise service bus and others can use those things. So in general, service-oriented architectures providing a very good uh, environment for writing real, reusable and dependent codes. Now, with that microservices, today's app-based environment, today basically everything becomes an app that has to be run inside a very small embedded devices like a smartphone or, or very low-end smartphone as well. So what they do, so they try to create, so this is, this microservices. Find a workflow among those small services and they can use the service-oriented architectures to deploy those microservices. Now, 
we will discuss that when we move from good. How we can use the cloud environment for this application? So how we can uh, use the cloud company platforms for running those kind of microservices using service-oriented application? So the first thing is that whenever we are thinking about the monolithic application, we can have different virtual machines. We can have one virtual machine to run the database application. We can have a cluster of virtual machines to run the business layer. And we can have some virtual machines to run the presentation layer. Similarly, we can have some virtual machines to run the security solutions in a video reusable fashion, and they can have a large cluster of games to deploy your monolithic applications. Another question is: Should we also deploy those microservices, the services in each game? Now, the question is: Should we have one game to one service, like the monolithic application, or not? That one we will discuss in our next topic. Now we will discuss about the container first, then I will discuss the, the, how the microservices will be mapped to the virtual machine. To understand the difference between a container and virtual machines, you can use these two pictures. Suppose this is a duplex. So in a local area, there are a number of duplex provided by a construction company and they give those duplex on brain to you. So you can think this kind of duplex as your virtual machines environment. But in that case, you have much more control on the services you are using. But here, you do not have much more control because you are using most of the common services like water, electricity, kind of things. You are using CRM with that. So you do not have much more control, but the cost is very less. So this is a, a non-technical description of a container versus game. Technically, if you see, already we discussed how technically a virtual machine works. We told that we have some blade server. On the base server, we install some software called hypervisor. On top of the hypervisor, we run some virtual machine. Each virtual machine has their base OS, their application binary, and the application running. So this is the traditional virtual machine environment. Compared to that, in container, if you see, on top of the host operating system, we don't need any hypervisor. We need a container in Z. And the Docker is the most popular container service provider. So Docker becomes a de facto standard uh, for container today. So you should need to install a Docker engine. The Docker engine allows you to create and place the containers. If you look at the containers, container binds the required dependent libraries or binaries along with the app. But it does not bind the OS like OS like the virtual method. It use, it shares all the content share the kernels of the host operating system so where they run. But the mapping or all the dependencies are easily referred to within that library or binary there. So that a container can easily be moved across the heterogeneous platform. So if you see the second scenario, in the second scenario, you can see that not only the Docker can be done inside the physical server, but Docker you can put inside of virtual machine. In this example, if you see, on top of the hypervisor, you installed a virtual machine. On top of the virtual, because the virtual machine also have a DSOS, on top of the DSOS, you can install the Docker engine, which can allow you to place the container. So you can place the container inside the VM as well, along with placing the container directly on the plate server. So containers are very flexible to install. Now, for running those microservices, instead of directly mapping them to the uh, directly mapping them to the uh, virtual machines, we can map them to the containers. Each of the microservices can be mapped to a different container. And these containers, a multiple a number of uh, services can, uh, can be put inside inside one virtual machine. Since the container are also running in isolation. Two services will not uh, interfere with each other in terms of the security, security breach kind of things. So with containers, the microservices have become much more versatile to deploy. It's very, it will have much more control over the deployment of the microservices. So the general practice that we are using today is that each of the microservices can be mapped to the containers, and multiple containers can be mapped to a virtual machines, and the virtual machine can be placed inside some blade servers of a cloud service provider so that uh, you can uh, easily run it. And not only that, the migration of microservices are very easy across the heterogeneous platform. If you look at this, if this is a VMware-based cloud platform, and if you have a target hyper-V-based cloud platform, these virtual machines, you may not migrate 
to this hyperbeam. But even in the container, even in the container, even though this is a heterogeneous cloud platform from VMware cloud to Hyper-V cloud, the container can easily be ported and this heterogeneity can be resolved by the Docker engine or any container engine. So if you have a container-based deployment for the microservices, you have a much better control on the load balancing and all other aspects as we discussed uh, during the migration of the game. So this part is for the container uh, case. Now let me discuss about the unikernels part. What is a unikernel? So unikernel are basically specialized single address space machine image constructed by library operating system. To understand this term, let me give you one example here. So already we discussed that in case of container, one microservices is not mapped to one virtual machine. One microservices are mapped to one container and multiple containers map to one virtual machine. That was the concept in container. But in unikernel, it's, it's, it's a hidden again reverse back. One VM for one service with unikernel. So it's not that, uh, that means if you have a microservice and you want to deploy it in a unikernel, each microservice will be deployed to one unikernel and this unikernel will be back to one VM. It's not a, a mini unikernel to one VM. So how it makes possible, let us look at this picture. So let us consider this kind of unikernel applications to be running. NGI NX1, uh, for example, let us take some service. So, if I want to run this NGINX service, like the uh, NGINX into one such microservices. Now, NGINX service use different layer services. It use some third party application, it use some library, it use some kind of operating system services, it use some kernel module. Now, if you look at this NGINX service, it does not use all the services of the player. It mainly use dash and game caps and some other services of the third party application. It uses only libssl and libcl and some other uh, services and libraries from the next layer, among hundreds of libraries. Similarly, it only uses SSH and init from the OS services. It does not use any other services provided by the web. Similarly, for the kernel, it uses HP4, NetFront, DLTFront, or some other services uh, from the modules from the kernel. It does not use many of them. Now, what the concept of unikernel is that can you create can you create a specialized specialized computer that contains all the modules? It contains kernel, it contains service, it contains library, it contains library application, but you do only the modules that needs. Remove all other modules that is not needed. And, and this this computer will basically run only in the Linux. It is not allowed to run any other application. So now you can see it's a very small computer and that can be run anywhere. Which has its own operating system, kernel, which has its own web services, which has its own dependent libraries and everything. And since the application, there's a single application running, the application can be run in privilege mode because there is no question of the rest condition. So we do not need any context switch. So such a deployment is called a unikernel environment. So this can be done inside of it. So we do not need to run it because it itself has its own environment. Now, if you look at the advantage of this kind of environment, first thing, since we are removing most of the modules, it becomes a kilobyte size, including the operating system. The whole computer image, including the waste and the services, it becomes a kilobyte size. So it is very fast to boot. Within a fraction of seconds, it booted compared to the uh, booting time of virtual machine. Second thing is that since there is a single application running, we are running that application, this, this application in a privilege mode. So we do not need any context switch. And, and you know that for context switch, lots of over in the OS there, so the application is run very fast. So booting time is very fast, application runs very fast. And this kind of things, this is a full fledged computer, it can run on the hypervisor like a VM, it can run inside a container, previous or it can run on the bare metal. So you have a diverse uh, options to run those unikernels. And since you remove most of the services from different layers, the attack surface is very small. Because most of the time the hackers do some unused services and they try to hack your applications. But since you are removing most of the unused services, 
for the hackers, the attack surface become very less. So they need to attack using only those modules that you also use as your service. So for those reasons, this unikernel becomes a very popular choice uh, for putting the applications on cloud environment. So with that, I covered this second part and uh, before I start discuss about the next topic, I want to take some questions if you have. I will share it, question answer, and then I will uh, discuss about the third topic of the resource scheduling part. So, in general, uh, we can see the difference between a virtual machine, container, and unikernel. In general, in a virtual machine, uh, we have our hardware, like a web server, that meets a software for hypervisor, that, that logs some virtual machines. This has its own OS and kernels, and on top of that, the users can run their own application. Than the platform or uh, software, whatever it is. In case of containers, we see that the OS and kernels are there on top of the hardware as a container platform, but within the container, they don't have the OS or the kernels part, it's not there. Only the libraries and applications are within the container. Compared to that, in unique kernels, the kernel, only the minimal kernel that is needed, are put it along with the uh, application, and that can be run inside the VM. So since your kernel is also there, I mean with you, that is your job or applications, it's carrying the waste kernel with you, it can run anywhere. So it can run on top of a uh, top of a smartphone, it can run on top of a uh, hypervisor, it can run anywhere. Since the kernel you are carrying I mean with your code. So now let me discuss about some uh little signaling problem uh, in cloud environment. So those resources can be a container, it can be a new kind of module, it can be a virtual machine. So I will, for simplicity, I will use the beam uh, to show how the beam can be placed uh, within the available digital machine. But instead of beam, the discussion is uh, equally, uh, equally acceptable for a container or new kind of module as well. Now, to understand that how the uh, cloud service provider uh, plays those beams, because they have some physical locations, we call it a PM, and they have a request of some virtual machines. Lots of virtual machines are requested from the user, and they have a set of available physical machines. So those virtual machines need to be launched inside some web server or the physical machines they have. So what have they done? How to take the decision to place those virtual machines? We call this problem as a PM placement problem. Now, the two important parameters in deciding the placement with the, how much CPU we have, how much RAM we have. We are going to have other parameters as well. But these two are the most important parameters. Whenever we launch a virtual machine, we are also, we need to specify how much CPU and how much RAM. These are the two most important parameters we need to specify for most of the virtual machine requests. And for some other specialized, we need to provide the bandwidth requirement, the disk requirement, or something else. So we can consider each of the physical machine as a large rectangle kind of thing. If we consider the normalized CPU as the length and uh, uh, normalized RAM size as the width, so we can consider each uh, available uh, resources, available physical machine as a large rectangle. Similarly, uh, each user requests some virtual machine, they also request some virtual CPU and virtual RAM. Based on their, after normalization, this can be represented as a small rectangle. Now, our problem is that having a large rectangle how optimally we can tap those virtual machines to there. So this can be easily solved by a two-dimension zero-one knapsack problem. But we have multiple such physical machines. So we have more than one physical machine ability. So knapsack problem we cannot do. So for that, we need to use two-dimension zero-one beam packing problem. And if we consider along with CPU RAM the hard disk or or the available bandwidth, then it becomes multi-dimension 01 beam packing problem. And we all know that a multi-dimension 01 beam packing problem is empty hard. So, so we need some heuristics to find that solution. So most of the research community and the cloud service provider are basically using some heuristics to solve this multi-dimension beam packing problem and accordingly to place those virtual networks uh, within the automated system. So, 
optimal means optimal solution will be provided by this kind of uh, linear programming problem. I am not going to discuss about those in details. But if you solve this, it will provide you the optimal placement for that. But this is empty hard that I told you. So for that, most of the users are uh, using most of the cloud service provider. Uh, we are using some heuristics. These are some of the popular heuristics uh, that is provided by CFO uh, in, in, in 2015. So they basically uh, use some resource-based fast feed algorithm, base feed algorithm, and overspeed speed algorithm. So the, as we use for the OS resource management, those resource management are just slightly modified. They deploy it for finding a uh, heuristic which provide some close solution to that optimal one. So uh, we have also provided one uh, solution in 2017 uh, called the aspect ratio based base speed algorithm. So considering the aspect ratio of those rectangles and the aspect ratio of this, so we can find the base speed algorithm. So we have shown that this provides a very close result to uh, this IMP or the optimal solution. That can also be used for providing this. And today is also the people are considering the energy modules and uh, other part as well. Uh, is, is considering how much energy, not only the best state, but what will the total energy be con consumed. So for that, they, they use the various energy models as, as well. So most of the popular energy model used in the market is the utilization base. So you can place a budget patients, so but that may not run lots of job. If it is not running lots of job, it will not uh, consume energy. So there is a popular model that how much power will be consumed for that utilization. So based on the utilization, for each physical machine, we can compute that PU, providing that P match. So this P match can be a parameter of each physical machine provided by the base server. So using that, you can have this kind of linear model to estimate how much power will be consumed by a particular utilization. And to, to find how much energy consumed to with the duration from P0 to P1, just integrate all the utilization because the utilization is not fixed. So you can measure the utilization by using some monitoring tools, how much utilization at time P. So now that utilization is a function of time, and this PU also is now a function of PUT. Now, if you perform the integration from P0 to P1 of that PUT, you can estimate how much energy you have. So based on that energy also, someone to some contradictory optimization. Someone try to optimize based on their, their resource utilization. Someone wants to optimize based on their energy. So it becomes a domain of multi-objective optimization problem. So, uh, so today, a lot of solutions also provided considering both the energy as well as the resource wasted as a multiple objective and provide some traditional multi-objective function. Using the machine learning and genetic algorithm also, we have some papers uh, where we provide some Load solution to the optimal one. Now, now let me discuss about a uh, general architecture, a general architecture for uh, for uh, scheduling the resources. So, already I told you that there is a set of cloud service provider. So, each cloud service provider provides some service stack, either in terms of infrastructure service or platform service or software service. Now, there is some cloud user. So the cloud user, it may be tedious job to decide which cloud service provider will give us the best solution for uh, for deploying our application. So for that, there is a middleware. So the middleware will work on behalf of the user to find the best cloud service provider, best services, and deploy them using the services. So now let me they, they are called the resource broker. This resource broker sometimes are provided by the service provider itself, or sometimes it is provided by a third party. But general structure of most of the cloud resource brokers uh, have these five modules. One is called application repository, second one is the policy and quality of service, and third one is monitor. And the other two are deployer and the controller. So what the user does, user for deploying his application into the application repository, that application he needs to run inside the cloud and using the minimal cost. And for using the cloud services, they can they can decide their own policy and the quality of service requirement or arbitration they need. And also they can have the dedicated monitoring. I want to monitor that specific features of my job running here. So these three will be provided by that cloud service user using some unified API. Now, once the application is deployed by the cloud service user, what the deployer model does, they take the application, 
take the policy and QS requirement and take all the available uh, cloud service provider in the market and that can do some uh, uh, optimization, that can run some optimization algorithms here. Lots of research is also going on in that particular module. How to find the optimal resource requirement for this application to make this policy and the quality of value. And based on that, this is taken by the deployer. What it does, they launch some virtual machines and place the virtual machines in the decided cloud service provider using their service tax. So these VMs can run some platform, these VMs can run some infrastructure, these VMs can run some software. And also these VMs can run uh, in different cloud service provider as well. After they deploy it and code their applications, they take the monitoring context provided by this cloud service user. And accordingly, they install some monitoring agents within the uh, each VM or some cluster monitoring tools. What this monitoring agent and the cluster monitoring tool does? They monitor the simple utilizations, energy, and various parameters they have, and they will send an alert message to the monitor. Now, the monitor will coordinate those alert messages. And if any abnormality is found in the resource field of those uh, environment where the jobs are running, the monitor will send some events, some events, events maybe some abnormal events or abnormal events kind of things, to some API to the controller. Once the controller receives that events, so they will take the policy and QS requirements. Uh, uh, from the policy and QS requirement also they can uh, send some events or the VM can also directly send some events to the controller. Once the controller receives some events, they will analyze the application policy QS requirements and what happened to that from the monitor. It can again perform some dynamic analysis on that current state and can fine tune the uh, resource requirement of that. So this kind of environment can uh, can be used for your auto scaling kind of environment. So let me give simple example how this kind of broker this architecture can auto scale your resource requirement. Suppose this is the cloud infrastructure and these are the resources, and as per time, your demand for uh, resources are increased and decreased like that. So how do you know? Because you deploy and your uh, middleware or the broker basically monitor all those things. So once they monitor that demands, the loads, that will send the, uh, the, the scale of events. That, that the demands increase, you need to add some extra load. So once the demand increase, the resource requirement increase, so the monitor will send the events to the controller, the controller will launch some extra load. So your resource increase. After that point, the monitor will observe that the demand decrease. So the monitor will send the events to scale down to the controller. The controller will reduce some of the virtual machine and your resource gradually decrease there. So based on whenever your uh, new virtual machine requires and whenever the extra virtual machine should be dropped, will be sent by the monitoring and the controller will actually learn some extra virtual machines or terminate some virtual machines to build your capacity and to reduce the total cost. So that way you can do. And not only that, not only that, sometimes you may, uh, you may, uh, what is it about this part? Sometimes you may, need, you may need to predict it, that what may be the future uh, demands. So instead of exactly monitoring what happened to that, if we can, if we can uh, predict what may be the future demands, so we can businessly add some virtual making so that the quality of service will not be affected so much. So for that, for that, what is that? The uh, main of them are using the markup team based predictions because that provides much better prediction in case of uh, resource utilization part. So what is that? They basically uh, the major uh, resource utilization map to some states, and based on that, the markup team have a history of state transitions. For example, the initial state can be S1. To S2, to S2 like that. Now, from that, it can generate a, a transition matrix for that, based on that probability. So, these are the probability, what is the probability of transition from the state 1 to state 1. So, that way, we can have the markup with matrix uh, for, for, from the history of the states, and after that, we can use this markup chain to find what is the transition probability for the future. And based on that uh, that map of chain, we can predict what should be the next case. For example, for this case, we can predict that the next one will be S1, and after that, the uh, next case will be S2. So based on that, if a particular state is above some threshold, we define some thresholds there. So if it's above some threshold, 
we can spin up or spin down based on the predicted load here. So that way also we can manage those resources. So with that, uh, I can complete my discussion. So if you have, I can discuss some questions. Any questions there? That uh, within the next half an hour, I can uh, give you some demonstrations of AWS how you can use it in the real platform. 